I'd like to start by asking us all to take a moment to look at our hands and to appreciate the beauty and complexity of millions of years of evolution and biomechanical optimization. Our hands are our first and most original basic tools for changing and manipulating our environment. As an engineer and a designer, I'm fascinated by tools and our relationship to them. And it's a two-way street. Tools and our, the way we use them, it's a complicated dynamic. Um, to illustrate this, I'd like us to do a, a simple thought experiment. Um, imagine a, a block of wood. And now imagine a hole in that block of wood. Chances are pretty good that we all just imagined a round, circular hole passing through that block. And the reason we did that is we all reached for an imaginary drill to drill that imaginary hole. And you know, our kind of our concept of how an a, something can be done is shaped by our notions of how it can be done. So creating a passage from one side of an object to another, the act of creating a hole is entirely governed by what we know the tools are for, for doing that action. So there's this, this concept that you know, tools, in addition to shaping our world, also shape us. And it's a very powerful dynamic. So what happens when we introduce a new tool that comes with few of the existing paradigms, or few of the existing problems uh, and limitations of existing tools that is cut from a, a different paradigm? And 3D printing is this new technology that is changing the way that we make things and our ability to think about and conceive and imagine uh, the things that we make. And this, is, this change is something that has, uh, has layers. Um, on the surface, you know, it's, it's additive manufacturing. We're using material in a new way instead of making things how we've made them for millennia from the beginning of human history where we subtract material away from a larger object. We just steadily chip it away, cut it away to expose a functional object within. Instead, now, we're using new technologies that allow us to weave molten threads of polymers together or use a laser to selectively melt together metal particles into you know, highly functional uh, geometries, um, very useful objects that we've never been able to make before. In addition to the, the operating principles of this new technology, the way we use it is different. Instead of you know, large, massive machines or centers of machines, um, people are using this technology uh, largely in the form of smaller machines distributed around the world. And there are tens of thousands of these smaller machines. You know, right now, by some estimations, there are uh, nearly a billion people within 10 miles of a 3D printer. And so it's this incredible kind of network for you know, the potential of affecting change. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, a vast departure from how most things today are made in these very centralized um, you know, mass manufacturing uh, factories. And finally, you know, 3D printing is, is opening a new frontier in design. We can make things with it that we've never been able to make before. Um, they don't differentiate between making uh, aerospace parts or, or hip implants, um, which you know, traditionally would have required vastly different methods of fabrication. So in order to fully realize this potential, in order to leverage this technology that we've never had before, that you know, comes with this freedom and versatility that we've never experienced before, we actually have a lot of unlearning to do. We have kind of millennia of ingrained assumptions about how we can manipulate materials, what materials are capable of. Um, and we have to unlearn that. We have to remove those limitations. We have to remove that assumption that holes are round in order to fully realize the potential of this technology. And you know, this technology, it's, it's, it's been getting a lot of attention for the past uh, maybe five, six, seven, eight years. Um, but the technology itself is almost 30 years old. And you know, that, that figure alone indicates that it's not just the technology that is going to change the world. It's the people that are going to drive it, and how they're going to drive it, and what they're going to do with it that is going to change the world. And I like to think of 3D printing less as an answer of how we're going to make things, and more so a question of what we're going to make and why. Why is that meaningful? What problem will this technology solve? And so today I'd like to talk a bit about um, a community that I work with called Enable that is using 3D printing to solve a very specific and broad problem that we've never actually been able to solve adequately to date. 
So this is my friend uh, Kieran. I work with him uh, in Enable. He, like many thousands of children born every year, uh, was born missing all of the fingers on his right hand. So we have a lot of uh, existing uh, technologies, methods for producing prosthetics for adults, but kids, unlike adults, are always growing. In the same way that they outgrow a pair of shoes every eight to 12 months, um, they outgrow prosthetics. And the challenge is, unlike a pair of shoes, prosthetics are extremely expensive using conventional means of fabrication. And in addition, uh, they are also time consuming to produce using conventional means. So in some cases, the time it takes to uh, produce the device after they've taken a casting of the arm, um, in some cases, the child will have outgrown the device by the time it's ready. So using 3D printing, the Enable community is able to rapidly produce custom prosthetics for a wide variety of these upper limb differences. And one of the reasons these are extremely low cost is that the hands themselves are mechanically driven, so there aren't any motors, there aren't any uh, sensors or wires, and so it can just be used with um, using the action, the flexion of the wrist, so it makes it a tremendously responsive device. And this all started about three years ago um, when Ivan Owen, an American uh, prop maker, began collaborating with Richard Van Oss, a South African uh, carpenter who lost uh, several fingers in a woodworking accident. Um, Richard, being a carpenter, uh, immediately set about making replacement fingers, and when he saw a video of Ivan's work with mechanical hands on the internet, the two reached out, began collaborating. Uh, eventually, they started using 3D printers. And during that process, they learned that, um, like Richard, there were many children who needed replacement fingers. And so they started working on 3D printed hands. And as their work spread, people around the world began to kind of organize around this problem. Um, it all started in just the comments on YouTube videos, people reaching out to each other, trying to find a way to connect to people with printers, reaching out to people who needed devices. And you know, in this way, this, this community, Enable, emerged. And now it numbers in the thousands, um, volunteers distributed all over the globe. And I've worked with this community for about a year and a half now. And you know, professionally, I work with, with 3D printing, um, both designing the technology, the machines, and the, the applications of the technology, and have actually learned a tremendous amount um, from this community. And I'd like to share some of those, those lessons today. So the first is that existing systems for making material products no longer work when you're making 3D printed goods. Um, traditionally, um, you know, in, in other companies I've worked at, you know, there's a very hierarchical structure of engineers. Everybody's an engineer. Um, you know, there's a senior engineer, some middle-level engineers, and then junior engineers. Uh, very linear paths of communication, very time-bounded development processes, and the goal is to create something that is static, that is fixed, that isn't changing. And this, this process works great when everybody's an engineer and everybody's under the same roof, but when you're a community of thousands of diverse volunteers in every time zone on the planet, that kind of way of working that paradigm breaks down. And what we've learned in this community is that while these kind of old hierarchical centralized systems don't work, these organic emergent processes that just, you know, they, they kind of self-organize self out of our community, these systems do work. And if we look at our process, I've organized it in, in this way because what's at the center is kind of even communication, or large amounts of communication between very diverse parties. So our community is made up of, of engineers, designers, lawyers, accountants, kind of garage enthusiasts, medical professionals, teachers, students. Um, it's a hugely diverse group, and everybody brings you know, unique perspectives and insights to the problems that we work on. And possibly one of the kind of most um, important groups uh, that participate in our design and fabrication process are the users themselves. So we have that kind of closed loop. Um, you know, everybody who works on the device, and even people who don't work on the device, all have a seat at the table. And instead of a kind of very time-bounded, discrete task-based approach, we have a process of, of constant iteration. We're never done designing. We're always working on improving the design, always taking feedback, always doing beta testing. And it's a process that involves many, many participants. And what this ends up looking like is, you know, hundreds of people have input into one design. We're crowdsourcing the features and the capabilities of the designs that we make. So 
the next lesson that builds upon this is that 3D printed objects aren't objects in the traditional sense. They're not static. They're instantiations of a constantly changing design concept. Um, and this is very different from how things have worked to date. Um, currently, you know, most, most things um, maybe have a yearly update cycle. So uh, things like cell phones, uh, computers, cars, the, you get a, there's a you know, 2014, a 2015, a 2016 edition. We operate at a much faster time pace. We update designs on a monthly, if not weekly, basis. And so what this looks like is um, you know, starting at uh, about 20, 2013, 2014, and moving on to 2015, we've seen the design progress steadily getting easier to assemble, more robust. And in addition to single designs evolving, they also branch. Um, they fork, they create new versions uh, that are more optimized for certain, certain special cases. And so it's this very organic process that in some ways mimics, uh, uh, mimics biology and in other ways mimics how software is developed. So we're kind of taking this, this hybrid approach here, taking the best of both hardware development systems and software development systems um, and really nurturing this organic process rather than trying to apply structure. And this you know, is how all of these different designs that our community has produced um, have, have come to be. It's this kind of process of constant evolution, um, of cross-pollinization, and, uh, and branching and merging. And finally, this distributed technology um, is extremely empowering, and it's, it's, it's an empowerment with layers, and it extends far beyond the Enable community. This is uh, Greg and Luke Dennison, two of our kind of early members uh, of our community. And they, um, like many other kind of uh, parent and child teams in our, in our community, they actually went out and got themselves a 3D printer. And so now, whenever Luke needs uh, a new hand, um, or they have an idea about how to make it better, they can actually sit down together and you know, work on taking, taking Luke and Greg's ideas and making, making them real. And there's an additional kind of layer to this is that, you know, a lot of this isn't about just making hands. Um, this is, you know, this, this, this object, this hand is, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of crystallization of identity. It's, it's, an, it's an, ex, an avenue for self-expression. And so, you know, kids are able to use it as a tool. I mean, it, it brings a, a tremendous amount of kind of social empowerment. Um, you know, a lot of the times when we, we have a remote fitting process where we take, uh, we get images of our recipients and we use software and a scale object to remotely size the devices. And a lot of these kind of early pictures we get of kids, you know, um, they'll have their hand missing fingers in their pockets, you know, behind their back. And um, after they get their device, I mean, you can see Luke here is, is waving with the device. And after they get the device, they're, you know, high-fiving, shaking hands, fist bumping. It's, um, this amazing kind of shift where there is, it's become this, you know, kind of focal point for so many new positive interactions. And so it's, you know, it's this pretty amazing process of, of social empowerment in addition to kind of functional, functional empowerment. Um, and we have a, one of the kind of more popular uh, themes of hands that we use and enable our um, superhero themed hands. Um, that's been extremely successful. Uh, you know, the kids are really into having uh, these themed hands, Superman, Iron Man. Iron Man particularly has uh, done a lot. You might have seen a video recently of Iron Man giving, giving a hand to a child. So another really interesting um, web-based community is Night Scout. Um, they're a community that provides methods for uh, real-time blood glucose monitoring for uh, individuals with type 1 diabetes, largely children. Um, they use an API for an existing um, FDA-approved medical device to live stream the data to, um, to the cloud where it can either be visualized on a, uh, a cell phone or um, a Pebble watch. And again, it's this kind of, this really interesting case of communities self-organizing around a problem and leveraging technology to allow, uh, again, in this case, kids to do things that they couldn't do before, to kind of, to move about the world with more freedom, to do things like going to uh, a sleepover at a friend's house, which to date would have been extremely, you know, a very stressful and challenging thing to actually accomplish. 
Um, another really inspiring community is uh, Go Baby Go. They're uh, uh, an outfit based out of the University of Delaware, and they run workshops uh, teaching people how to hack these um, low-cost, you know, maybe $100, $150 electric cars into mobility devices for um, uh, children with uh, mobility challenges. And it's an incredible thing to give back to a kid who, at that, especially at that early age, when you know, when socialization and you know, independence in motion are so important to development, um, to kind of organize, organize a play date with, a, you know, with other children where these kids can, can get around, can you know, interact with each other, can get into trouble. It's, it's you know, tremendously impactful at that, at that early age. And so these projects are all glimpses um, into the, the near future about how these distributed methods and technologies can be leveraged by communities to solve real problems in the world, problems that haven't been solved because we've been approaching them with what are now becoming outdated paradigms, outdated approaches. And there's, there are many layers of, of patterns and symmetries between this. There are networks of people, there are networks of technology, there are networks of devices. Um, but it's all non-hierarchical, it's all distributed. There's no kind of central authority. It's, it's these emergent, self-organized structures and directives that are solving and systematically dismantling these problems. And they're you know, really affecting real change in the world. And so what's most exciting about this is, again, there's, it's not just about solving problems in the world. It's about kind of finding new layers of meaning, both in the world and in these technologies, finding ways to make a better world with these technologies. And you know, with, with Enable, largely we've seen the t these, these kind of dynamics of uh, empowerment and, and self-expression, um, these you know, really interesting kind of new modes of, of empowerment through technology. And you know, these communities, these projects are influencing how this generation of kids is, is growing up, what they know to be possible. They're participating in making this better future. And so the really exciting thing is, you know, what, what are these kids who know that anything is possible? What are they going to grow up to do in the world? Thank you. <laughs>